On March the 8th, 2021, Hornby announced a double gauge model of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway's 1838 build, Lion, to much thunderous applause from enthusiasts who globally recognised the engine from her starring role in the Titfield Thunderbolt. On March the 9th, 2021, Rapido Trains announced a double gauge model of the Titfield Thunderbolt. Oh, a duel! How very delightful! Uh, yeah, I know, I didn't coin that reaction, nor did I particularly want to make this editorial as I'm pretty bored with this same story popping up all the time, but people have been asking me about this sort of thing on and off for the last two years or so, and to be fair, it does make for the kind of interesting pub talk that I usually try to go for on this show. Now before we begin discussing this topic, I want to make a few things perfectly clear. Firstly, no, I don't care about nor buy into the idea of cancelling anybody, particularly manufacturers like Hornby and Rapido, so this editorial is by no means a boycott on anybody. And secondly, no, I'm not doing this from the perspective of a railway modeler, seeing as that pastime requires having tons of money, and when you're an independent filmmaker, you tend not to have money, especially if you're in the UK. I mean, I used to be a railway modeler, but spiralling prices and life circumstances forced me to cut back on having nice things years ago. But at least this way, as an ex-railway modeler looking in from the outside, nobody can accuse me of questionably obvious bias in the way they do with various YouTubers who built up a following from reviewing modeling products. So let's have a go at this. Obviously this isn't the first time that modeling manufacturers have clashed over the same product, nor is it a situation that's exclusive just to Hornby. The same thing happened with Acura Scale and Dapol over Manners recently. But it's a hot topic for anybody in a position to criticize Hornby as it seems to have become something of a trend for them in the last three years. Take, for example, the Battle of the Terriers between Hornby and Rails of Sheffield. The Rails one was announced in March 2018 in collaboration with Dapol and the NRM, with Hornby announcing theirs 10 months later. But the Hornby one was just delivered first at a lower price. This was a big deal for them as they'd been making a Terrier since 1998, having acquired second-hand tooling from Dapol. Unfortunately, the old Hornby Terrier always suffered a bit of a mixed reputation, seeing as the 1989 tooling was a somewhat weird Jekyll and Hyde amalgamation of the A1 and A1X variants. But at the time, it was a big hit, so Hornby chose to renew the tooling with updated measurements to separate the two variants in the build-up to their centenary. Their reason being, they've been making one for years and it's a popular model, so why the hell drop it? Rails responded to Hornby's intentions by branding their Terrier as the premier product in an attempt to justify its higher price tag, but with hindsight, this turned out to be a bit of a mistake. If you want corned beef, Hornby. If you want fillet steak, Rails. Reports came through of completed Rails Terriers not running properly, being a pain to dismantle and reassemble for maintenance, arriving with parts broken off, paint being chipped, electrics burning out, and basically ranging from poor to exceptional at best. Hornby's Terrier, while believed by some to be far from perfect, was generally better received, and by turn of good fortune, people staying indoors during the 2020 pandemic enabled Hornby to turn its first half-year profit in 10 years. Mind you, the real winner of the Terrier battle seemed to be James May, with his two-part Big Trouble in Model Britain series covering the development of the new Terrier and the war between manufacturers. Since then, Hornby has faced similar clashes with their Rocket third-class coaching stock clashing with Rail's own variant, and more recently with Hatton's over generic four-wheeled non-corridor coaching stock. Now, the separation in price with the four-wheelers hasn't been as high as that of the Terriers. There's only £5 in it, but there's more detail on the Hatton's ones if the samples are anything to go by. But Hornby have already sold theirs in big numbers, and there seems to be enough scope for modelers to further customise the Hornby ones in their own way, depending on preference of region. But nevertheless, the clash over rocket coaching stock led to Rails cancelling theirs, which was priced nearly twice as high as Hornby's, and no longer stocking Hornby products in their outlet. Now, there's no indication that either Hornby or Rapido intend to sell Lion or Thunderbolt sets in big numbers, but given the complexities of detailing and potentially high costs involved in making something to tie in exclusively with the 70th anniversary of the film, it remains to be seen if they're going to be more than limited editions or not. So how does that explain two manufacturers going after the same product at once? Well, the main problem seems to be, because railway enthusiasm is such a niche hobby and railway modelling is such a niche extension of that hobby, word of mouth is extremely powerful. So if one piece of info gets out or gets misinterpreted, it can lead to a long-lasting narrative of misinformation becoming widely accepted as fact. So modelling firms kind of have to keep their mouths shut over what they're doing. The main problem then with keeping a tight lip on future products is, once a manufacturer has spent tens or even hundreds of thousands of pounds on research and development, it's kind of hard to cancel it at the last minute just because minds think alike. Once all the money's been spent, cancelling the only way of making it back just adds to the risk. 
So it's hardly surprising the manufacturers would want to see a project through to the end, and it's equally unsurprising that long-term secrecy leads to the occasional war. We were here first. What do you mean? We thought of it first. Oh, yeah. Yes, a couple of years ago. <laughs> now, there are those who say that if you see a product from one firm but can't quite afford it, there shouldn't be any harm in another firm making the same product at a lower price, thus allowing anyone to still have one. But then, of course, the credibility of that answer boils down to just what sort of value for money both of those products turn out to be, just like any other goods. The question then is, why split the market over a model of an engine which, while well known by enthusiasts, isn't in as much high public demand as a Terrier or some four-wheelers? You can replicate all kinds of periods and formations with those, but with Lion and Thunderbolt, the options are more limited. The main difference is Rapido seem to have the upper hand in terms of exclusive rights to selling theirs as the Titfield Thunderbolt. So people hoping to buy Hornby's Lion purely for the purpose of owning Thunderbolt may be disappointed to learn that Hornby don't have the rights to do so. Furthermore, Rapido's set doesn't just stop at the locomotive. The full range goes the whole hog with stuff from the film, including a towed brake van, the Pearson Crump Bedford bus, the Wispeach and Upwell tram car, the makeshift carriage fashioned from Dan's house, and 3D printed figurines of the cast. Rapido already make an LNER J70 tram that's reported to be very good, so that could double up with the Wispeach and Upwell tram car used in the film, which no doubt kids and adults would be thrilled about. It's interesting how the first announcement dates from both firms were pretty much back to back. It's not my place to guess how one found out another was making the same model, but I wouldn't be surprised if Studio Canal got a call from one of them and answered, oh, you want to license Titfield? You do realize these guys beat you to it, right? But like I say, not my place to speculate. Another question people may ask is, why does everybody make the same stuff when there's a whole plethora of untapped rolling stock ready for them to make and sell? Which you could say, they're kinda right. There are indeed big gaps in the market which usually get filled by people kit-bashing or scratch-building them. The question then becomes simply, how many people would buy one of those gaps ready to run? And when I say buy, I don't mean nag the manufacturers into making it, saying that they definitely will buy it, see the finished product on the shelf and then reconsider buying it after having a mild heart attack from seeing the price tag and just pass it by while it sits on the shelf gathering dust and eventually has to be flogged off at a much lower price just so the retailer can finally get rid of it. Besides which, some locomotives are simply going to be more popular than others. They're never going to be everybody's cup of tea, but an LMS Black 5 or a Gresley A4 will almost always outsell a 1361 or an LMS Garrett. Hell, pretty much everybody who's dabbled in railway modelling would have had at least one loco based around that 040 shunter at some point in their lives, and no doubt crashed it more times than Richard Hammond because it has a scale speed that makes Mallard look like an asthmatic snail. Oh sure, there's an obligation for the manufacturers to market their products in a way that sells, regardless of how good they are. But unfortunately, their main feedback over whether or not a product is worth doing is how well it translates into continuous profit for them. Yay, capitalism! <laughs> it would be clever with hindsight to say that Hornby could have chosen a different early railways prototype like Planet or Novelty or San Parade to follow up from their rocket last year. But again, no thanks to Titfield, they might have chosen Lion just because they think she might be the generally more appealing machine from that period. Or they may not. Who knows for sure. This isn't the first big Clash release that two modelling firms have announced, nor will it be the last. Some may take it as a position of spite, others will see it as pure coincidence. Some will see it as one copying another's original homework, others may think these kind of things are inevitable, etc etc. But either way, it highlights the problems that model railway manufacturers have been facing throughout the hobby's history. It makes me thankful that railway YouTubers aren't locked in a similar war over subject matters. Though, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if we're all secretly at war with Michael Portillo. I'm not going to make any predictions over who's going to come out on top, because the only way we're literally going to see what happens next is for both manufacturers to deliver their intended models and just see how well they're received. Meanwhile, what was the web address for the petition of a follow-up documentary on their development, James? www.go on BBC, give us another series. This one was very inexpensive to make and I'll even have a haircut if you say yes, .co .uk. <laughs> If only. I'm Chris and I'm here to gauge the issue. Time and time again I lost my mind in lockdown